talking. I get a little excited sometimes, so I'll be, I have a habit of accelerating as I speak. So if that happens, just let me know. I should slow down. Um, I started in higher education at a college in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and it was Red River College, which was a two-year system. So that meant you generally with certificates and diplomas that were being offered by the college. And all of them were very practically focused. And what I mean by that is, uh, as the, the students graduated, they were being targeted for employability. So we had programs that ranged, you know, as you would expect with a you know, polytechnic kind of a system, but programs that ranged from you know, applied computer sciences to hospitality, restaurant, tourism, uh, to uh, marketing, management, and related fields. And one of the things that I, uh, did with, within the university is I took a certificate program, and this is required by the province of Manitoba, is if you start teaching at a college, every instructor has to take, usually it's about a two-year certificate program, that looks at principles of adult education. And it, so it was, it emphasized uh, pedagogy, it emphasized how do you design curriculum, how do, what are instructional design models, how do you plan your lesson plans, that, that whole very practical kind of a focus. And uh, one of the things that I learned was that many of the skills that I assumed were common, because I grew up with computers, I grew up playing with computers and experimenting a lot with different kinds of tools and technologies, I, I assumed to a degree that other people had sort of a similar level of expertise with computers. And my, exp you know, my expertise wasn't through the roof. It's not like I was an expert in using a computer, but it's I was functionally capable. I could do what I wanted to do. I could work with Microsoft Word. I could work with a spreadsheet if I had to. I could uh, delete everything off a computer, reboot it, and you know, install Linux or, or whatever. I mean, basic skills that I think everyone should have. And yet when I started teaching at, uh, at the college, I remember at one point I did a, a program in Introduction to Computer Applications. And uh, I did, it was a, an orientation, so it was a three-hour session. And when I was done with this session, I, I'd introduce them just to basically what is a computer, how does a computer work, what are, you know, how do, what is, what's a program, and those kinds of things. And at the end, one of the individuals I was done, and I said, does anyone have any questions? And then this one gentleman at the back of the room raised his hand, and he said, can you tell me again, what is Windows? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so I had this real sense of, uh-oh, uh, this, this probably won't work out so well. So um, one of the issues around this is that in education, the reason we use education uh, in our society, obviously, is because it's about progress. Right? Education is about setting up the opportunity for the next generation. It's about setting up the opportunity for anyone in society who has access to a reasonable quality education to improve their life to improve the opportunities that they have. And so there's a real need that in terms of our societal context, education is about the, the development of a future. It's about creating a future because the things that we experience today, whether it's the mobile devices, uh, wireless, the internet, uh, whether it's the vehicles that we drive or whether it's the, the medical attention or the medical uh, support that we receive, all of those are prefaced on an educated person employing the scientific method or something very much like it in order to improve uh, an innovation or to improve an invention. So that's sort of the foundation of a society and the foundation of our future is really the quality of the education system that we have today and the opportunity that we give our students. Now, you've probably heard over the last few decades there's been an enormous increase in interest in changing the education system. There's a lot of talk about the future of education. And one of my favorite quotes on this is from Carl Breider, who's written extensively on connected knowledge and what does it mean to really be an educated person in a society such as we, we face today. And uh, he hits it right on the head, I think. And, and he takes a very empirical, a very solid academic orientation to change and why we need to be knowledgeable, not just in the tools, but in a variety of disciplines that allows us to, to contribute. And his statement is that, you know, for the most part, educational futurism is a mix of trendiness, bad psychology, and uh, technological impressionability. So there's this real sense of, oh, I use Twitter. I better write an article about it. Now, everybody in school should use Twitter. 
Now, in some cases, I would say, well, yeah, that's probably not a bad idea. Educators should be the most experimental members of a society. We should always be playing with new tools and playing with new ideas. So I'm not against, you know, oh, let's try out Twitter. But I'm against this notion that just because there's a bunch of tools that are increasing or being used, that we necessarily have to use them in education right away. We have to use them thoughtfully and intentionally. And the reason for that is that, as Kieran Egan has stated, is that, you know, the tools that we use, what we use in the education process, they essentially determine what and how we're going to learn. So when, and I know... This is a common statement I hear, especially when I chat with instructional designers and, and people who are in the design of curriculum or the design of teaching process. And they'll make a statement to the effect of, well, technology is neutral, right? It's how we use it that's important. And uh, you may well agree with that. Um, I typically find that I have concerns with that statement because technology does something. If we decide to use Blackboard, it's not neutral. Blackboard is, a, is an ideology of control that is embedded in software. So when you choose to use Blackboard, you're really choosing a whole ideology around teaching. When you choose to use blogs, or when you choose to use wikis, or other kinds of social media in your teaching, you're not just choosing a tool. You're choosing a way of looking at information and a way of looking at interaction that people have in social settings. So, the Kieran Egan quote, I think, really gets to that, where it's, you know, with the tools that we decide to use, they really create our learning and our educational opportunities. Or, you've probably heard the McLuhan quote, which, uh, as with many things with Marshall McLuhan, is, is uh, more elegant, but it's, you know, we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. So when we start looking at the tools that, that students are using in society today, or we start looking at the tools that maybe your children or your friends or whoever is using, then... That's essentially what you're up against, is looking at the kinds of tools that they're using are shaping how they are going to interact and how they're going to see the world. I'll give you an illustration of this. Just this morning, um, I had a spare morning and had a chance to do a little bit of walking around. Uh, it's a you know, gorgeous city and a beautiful hotel where I'm located. And, and uh, as, after I went for a stroll, I came back, and uh, one of the things I try to do wherever I have a spare moment is I have a series of learning materials that I like to sort of crunch my way through so that when I have, you know, 10, 20 spare minutes, instead of sitting there doing nothing or watching TV, I'll try and, you know, watch a short video or a tutorial or anything. So I went to Khan Academy and uh, started watching, uh, it was a 10-minute lecture on calculus. And as I started watching it, I found, wow, is my attention span shot. Like, 10 minutes is a long time for me to sit in front of a computer. Five minutes is okay. But 10 minutes is getting to be too long. And so that's what I mean where, you know, the tools do shape us because we've been conditioned that in the past we would sit in front of a TV and we could watch an hour-long program. We were, we were conditioned to do that. When you have participatory technologies, something that doesn't just happen to you, but you happen to it, you have a lot of control. I mean, all of you here, you know, you've got a phone in your pocket, so if you start getting bored, you can start texting or, or reading email or, or doing whatever else it is. Uh, so there's this sense in which we're not uh, at the same state of control, where the system only happens to us. So I found even there, I've got this Khan Academy video going in the background, but I'm quickly checking email, I open up TweetDeck to track a few tags. And so it was that realization, which periodically hits, where it's like, wow, you know, in, in less than a decade, my way of thinking and interacting with the information has been completely revised. Mm -hmm. And the part that's perhaps most shocking is that it's really just at the starting point. You know, the, the trends, that, and I'm sure if you've been to academic conferences, you've heard people talk about, think of it five years ago, there was no iPhone and there was no iPad. Well, several years ago, there was no iPad. And so these are changes that have happened in an astonishingly short period of time. And again, looking back at a, a quote from someone who's actually a bit of a techno-critic, uh, Neil Postman, I think he captures it very well when he says that when you look at these kinds of mediums, you know, a new medium, whether it's the internet or new tools or new technologies, it's not just that the medium is necessarily an add-on to what was there before. What a medium does is it changes everything. It, it rewrites all of the rules, it rewrites all of the ways that we interact with people, how we create information, how we share that information. And so when we look at the internet, when, when I hear, and I certainly value the opinions of instructional designers, uh, when I look at the internet and the role it plays in a classroom, I'm sort of caught in that awkward place where I'm kind of confused because on the one hand, um, the tools and the technologies that we have access to really do change the teaching process. But on the other hand, there's something that happens in the teaching process that requires depth, time, 
focus, thinking, reflection that isn't always captured in social media. So I'm sort of in that in-between space where on the one hand I recognize we have to respond to these tools and technologies that, that are common everywhere because they're changing how we interact. But by the same account, what it means to be an educated person really hasn't changed much. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the presentation. But before I dive into that, I just want to talk about a few things that I would look at as some of the most substantial shifts that we see, not just in education, but really in society as a whole. So if I was to look at and say, what's the most dramatic stuff that's going on? What are the biggest changes? Um, I would sort of put together a list of, of items like this. So these are sort of six points that I feel are most dramatic. And I'm not saying a shift from something to something else because, you know, if I put up and say we're shifting from hierarchies to networks, that's not 100% true because we've never exclusively been in hierarchies. We've always functioned in networks. So I'm always a little resistant you know, when you get that dichotomy, that Web 1.0, Web 2.0 table. Um, it, 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 it's not always completely accurate. So it's not that we're shifting from something. What I'm trying to emphasize though is we're shifting to these things. So on the first point, we're shifting to networks. And that's a, that's a reality, not just in education. I mean, it's in society, it's in global travel. You might recall in 2003, there was an outbreak of SARS. Uh, and SARS was a, a disease or a pandemic almost that no one had seen before or the medical professional wasn't familiar with it. And the question that they faced is, what is it? How do we minimize its spread? How do we sort of confine it to an area so it doesn't move beyond that until we can understand it better? Well, because of global travel networks, that's much, much harder than what it was, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So what ended up happening was by the time SARS was on the radar of the medical profession, it had already spread to dozens of countries around the world. And in Toronto alone, we had dozens of deaths as a result of SARS. And so that's what I mean when I say, you know, it's a shift to networks where globally, the world is a much smaller place than we've perhaps seen it to be in the past. Some of you might be familiar with the work of researchers that have looked at uh, this concept of uh, seven degrees of separation. Is that a term you've heard before? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so it comes from a few areas. It's been popularized by uh, this notion of Kevin Bacon, right, where, well, he's a person on a notion. But anyway, so it's popularized by Kevin Bacon, uh, using him as, a, as an example, where researchers or individuals, we wouldn't call them researchers, would look at and say, you know, well, how far are you separated from Kevin Bacon? And the rule was, if you were in a movie with him, then you were connected to him. And so you would try and get a connection that moves from, okay, this person was a movie with Kevin Bacon here, and this person was a movie there. So those two are connected by that degree of separation. And there's other illustrations, uh, you know, in, in mathematics and other fields as well, where they're trying to track how close, like the Erdosh number kind of a concept, how close are you to a certain person by your connections. And initially, the, the view had been seven degrees of separation is how far we're separated globally. It takes us seven jumps to move from one person to any other person in the world. And that seems ludicrous, but I think it was about two years ago, a similar study was done looking at the digital environment, what the digital world had done. And in that case, they actually reduced it to something between five and a half and six connections. So globally, technology is increasing our connectedness. We live in networks. We function in networks. I can honestly say... I would, that probably about 80% of my days, I spend more time talking to people in other parts of the world than I do talking to my office mates because of, you know, the, the ability to interact seamlessly with others and, you know, Facebook or Twitter or Flickr or whatever you use um, certainly reduces the scope of those network structures. So it's so easy now to hop and connect to anyone. So that's one critical thing. There's a, a broad scale transition economically, politically, socially, you know, physically to networks. Uh, it's an underpinning structure as uh, Alberto Laszlo Barabashi said, you know, networks are everywhere. All you need is an eye for them. And so that's sort of a core premise. That's where we're going. A second critical trend is one of moving to participatory and open culture. If you've tracked any of the movement, I mean, Occupy Wall Street is one. Uh, right now, what we have happening in, uh, in Canada, I just read this morning that in Montreal, we had uh, huge student strikes due to tuition increases. And so we ended up with uh, about 85 uh, students being arrested today because of vandalism and other activity as part of that strike. I remember reading, I think it was two or three years ago, Puerto Rico had significant student strikes as well. So the ability for people to organize themselves is 
very low. The barrier is low. You don't have to put an ad in a newspaper. Say, next week, Friday, we're going to organize here. Uh, but you can literally, in a matter of uh, days, hours, 